Hello and welcome. Just having a business plan isn't enough. Dreams need financing. In 1920, Donald Douglas wanted to start his own company and build an aircraft that could fly non-stop coast to coast in America. His financier was David R. Davis, who came in as partner for $40,000. That is about half a million dollars today. The company they formed was the Davis Douglas Company. The plane they designed and built was the Cloudster. They found that it couldn't fly that distance, but was the first aircraft to carry more than its own weight in fuel and cargo. Davis left the partnership with a $2,500 promissory note. In hindsight, he should have stayed. Douglas renamed his company the Douglas Aircraft Corporation. That became McDonnell Douglas, which later merged with Boeing. Davis had more to contribute to advancing aviation. He was freelancing as an aeronautical engineer and looking for development funds for his airfoil design, the fluid foil. He had designed the profile in reverse, starting with a basic low drag teardrop shape and modifying it to provide lift. In comparison with conventional designs, Davis's design was relatively thick, having a short cord. Davis claimed that the new wing would offer reduced drag over wings then in use and offer considerable lift even at a small angle of attack. Additionally, the thickness of the wing provided space for fuel storage or even embedded engines, an idea that was in vogue at the time. In 1937, he approached Reuben Fleet, the president of Consolidated Aircraft, to invite them to use his design in their large flying boats. The wing's ability to generate lift at low angles of attack was useful in flying boats as it would reduce the need to pull up the nose for takeoff and landing. Neither Fleet nor Isaac Ladin, Consolidated Chief's engineer, were impressed. A few days later, however, Ladin convinced Fleet to pay for construction of a model and wind tunnel test at the California Institute of Technology. Initial results of the Caltech wind tunnel tests were disappointing. Test instruments did not support Davis's predictions. However, Davis and others determined that the Caltech wind tunnels instruments were not sufficiently sensitive to detect improvements from the Davis wing tests, despite being among the most sophisticated of their kind at the time. After recalibration of the Caltech wind tunnel instruments, tests showed significantly improved readings. In fact, they were unbelievable. Caltech recalibrated its wind tunnel and ran them a second time, and then a third time. When it delivered its report to Consolidated, it indicated that the wing appeared to deliver everything it claimed, but Caltech also suggested it might be a wind tunnel fluke. Fleet allowed it to be used on Consolidated's new twin-engine flying boat, the Model 31 XP4Y Corregidor. The Model 31 made its first flight in 1939, vindicating the Davis wing. By this point, Consolidated was already working on a secret project for a new bomber to improve on the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress that was just entering service and had selected the Davis wing for this project as well. The Model 32, which would become the B-24 Liberator, first flew in December 1939. The same basic wing would also be selected for the consolidated B-32 Dominator. Only later was the reason for the Davis wing's performance properly understood. Largely through accident, the shape maintained laminar flow further back from the leading edge to about 20 or 30 percent of the cord compared to the 5 or 20 percent managed by most airfoil sections of that era. Although other designs greatly improved on this, with some designs maintaining laminar flow to upwards of 60% of cord, the Davis wing represented a great improvement at that time. The Davis wing was a major component of the B-24 Liberator bombers of World War II. 
Consolidated Aircraft Navy PRY-5 Catalina and Army B-24 Liberator were approved as outstanding long-range performers. The B-24's high aspect ratio Davis wing was shoulder mounted. It was highly efficient, allowing a relatively high airspeed and long range. It had a six foot larger wingspan than the B-17's wing, but a lower wing area. This gave the B-24 a 35% higher wing loading. The relatively thick wing held the promise of increased tank ridge while delivering increased lift and speed, but became unpleasant to fly when experiencing heavier loadings at high altitude and in bad weather. The Davis wing was more susceptible to ice formation than contemporary designs, causing distortions of the aerofoil section and resulting in the loss of lift. The Davis wing was less able to absorb battle damage. As speeds of aircraft increased, the Davis wing's increased high-speed drag meant the design was no longer popular. Thank you for watching.